1 John 5, 16, one of the most difficult passages in the Bible, says if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give life to those who commit sin not leading to death, end quote. Now the prayer part of that verse isn't too difficult. You know, basically it says, if you see someone in the church committing sin and they don't die, pray for them. Or if you see a brother in the church doing something so egregious that God may take their life, let it go. I mean, the instruction of the verse is pretty plain. But the confusion lies in the idea of a sin that actually leads to death. And making it more confusing is the fact that John doesn't seem to need to explain it to anyone. Thus, it was something everybody in the first century seemed to know about. Now, there's over a dozen views on this verse, but two of those are the most likely. Let me explain both. First is just that the verse speaks of a non-Christian, a false convert who's hanging around the church. He's heard the messages, he sung the songs, he enjoyed the potlucks, never really bought in, and there's really no hope for his soul. And John says, you can stop wasting your prayers on him. Now, I'm not certain that that's always correct, but there is some biblical precedent behind the view. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, quote, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it just won't be forgiven. And Hebrews 6, 6 specifies that praying for such a guy is fruitless because it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So John's point, if that were the right interpretation, isn't to forbid praying for them, but just to say prayer isn't gonna be answered in that case. In effect, sadly, it's over. But the other possibility, and one that I would recommend, is he's talking about a believer. And there's a sin that's so serious, it could harm a home or a church. So God actually takes the life of that person. That's, it's not an eternal damnation, but more of an earthly judgment. Now we also have precedent for this view. In Acts chapter five, Ananias and Sapphira literally dropped dead after lying to Peter or the Holy Spirit. And Paul even talked about those who sleep or died after abusing the Lord's table. And he even references an end quote destruction of the flesh about a Corinthian man who'd been having an affair with his stepmother. Uh, the reality is the first century churches knew what this sin looked like. And they experienced likely a lot more early death than we do. And it was likely God's way of purifying their churches. Regardless of either view, this verse should awaken for all of us the gravity of any habitual sin. It should drive us to our knees in confession, and it should prompt a healthy reverence every time we participate in the Lord's Supper.